Okay. Liam, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Hi, everyone. Well, welcome to our first real interview. This is Eitan Hirsch, political scientist at Tufts University. We are doing this stream to learn about politics from people who are doing cool political things, people who have real goals and real strategies. And uh, this is for students and for anyone who wants to listen to talk to people across the political spectrum and uh, and learn some practical insights about uh, about politics in the United States. And I am honored to be joined today by my friend, Liam Kerr, who you can see on your screens right now. Um, Liam hails from just a few miles from here, also in Massachusetts. Um, I won't give too much of a biography other than to say that uh, Liam is, I think, one of the leading political and policy entrepreneurs of our generation, particularly here in Massachusetts, has been involved in um, a lot of exciting state level uh, policy on topics like education. Um, Liam is famous or in some circles infamous for a role he played <laughs> related to the Olympics a while ago. Um, very active in many policy areas in Massachusetts, but um, in the last couple of years has uh, started a new organization and helped build this new organization focused across the country on a particular goal related to um, to moderation in politics. And um, and that's why we're here. So we're going to have a little conversation. We're going to play a little fake Mario Kart and hopefully learn something. So welcome, Liam. Great, great to be here. So you, uh, I hope you 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 uh, feel as honored as you really are in my heart for being the first uh, the first true guest on the show. We had a guest last week who's an academic, who's a, a dear friend, Hari Han, and uh, uh, um, who uh, who's an academic. But you're a first real political actor, so welcome. I, I feel honored, and this is my first real video game in quite a while. So. Okay, great. Did you practice, by the way? I practiced once. Um, and it. Uh, I kind of was more ski free than Mario Kart, I think. But, um, you know, we're going to do this live. Excited. Okay. Doing a lot. Okay. Before we get in there, uh, so this is about uh, learning about goals and strategies. So, first, can you tell me maybe a little bit of background? What is the goal of this organization, Welcome Pack, and, you know, why, why, did, why did you form it? Yeah. So, Welcome Party and Welcome Pack, we want to build a coherent, strong faction within the Democratic Party. So we are partisan centrists, and we want that coherent, strong faction within the party to be able to reach out to voters in the middle, often using former Republicans or credible messengers who can communicate effectively with swing voters, bring those people into a party uh, and into winning elections so that we can not just win, uh, but also govern effectively after we win. And why? Like, who cares? Well, uh, we're anti-authoritarians, and we think that the path to beating authoritarianism lies in partisan centrism. Um, there is a lot of energy and investment and actually a real authentic community in nonpartisan democracy reform and often anti-partisan third parties or other bids to create something better than the two-party system that we have now. Um, many people in our on our team, in our network, agree or overlap with a lot of that hope. Um, but we think that the best path to actually defeat authoritarianism and make our democracy work is by practicing democracy. And we want to practice democracy with other people so that we feel like we're in a community. We want to demonstrate that the electorate is not actually as polarized as it seems. Um, so if kind of one challenge that we have is a lack of kind of coherent uh, significant community throughout the country for these partisan centrist moderates within the Democratic Party. Um, a second problem is this belief that actually we couldn't even do it if we tried. Even if we did get together with the Democratic Party, our country is so polarized in the Ezra Klein -y sense that, well, what good would it do? Um, we actually think that polarization is overhyped a bit, that there are far, far more gettable voters that may not be political hobbyists, but may um, actually be relatively easily nudged one way or the other, and that we need to be active depolarizers to go out and, um, you know, actually give them a reason to split their tickets or give them a reason to vote for Democrats instead of Republicans. And that there's a lot of, um, the third piece uh, is there's a lot of gaps in the political marketplace. So there are congressional races even 
And even in, after two, three, four cycles in the Trump era, where Republicans only have a four point advantage and the Democrats don't even put up a credible candidate. Um, and so it's these th three things have kind of a lack of kind of coherent community within a partisan centrist faction that's needed to defeat authoritarianism. The second uh, uh, piece being this kind of overhyped polarization that we can overcome as long as we find leaders and invest in them and have them go out and bring people in. And then the third thing is the ridiculous market inefficiency that's happened as we've gone from spending $4 billion on elections, uh, inflation adjusted a, a little while ago to $10 billion per cycle, but 95% of the money being spent on just 10% of seats that are deemed competitive. Um, so, you know, our program, you know, is designed to be able to reach out to those people in those places, empower those leaders and show that um, we can fix the whole thing. Okay. So, so someone might, I mean, let's assume we agree that, uh, democracy is good. <laughs> um, someone might disagree with your goal because they think a, like a more of a purist, uh, uh, liberal or conservative voice is actually what we need. Um, or they might disagree with your goal because they, um, don't believe that two parties or, or the, the basic structure of politics we have now is, is sustainable. So they want bigger reforms. Um, those I see as the two, the two challenges to the goals. Forget the strategies for a second. Do you do you, do you agree? Do you think that's right? Yeah, I think um, when people invest their time, energy, resources in us, um, when they believe in us, they could be doing so because they think moderation is a price you have to pay to defeat authoritarianism. Um, and then there's also people who feel like actually moderation itself is good. Um, and that actually going out and getting more moderate Democratic candidates who can put more races in play and moderate the political system overall is a good thing. Um, so, yeah, people who believe the inverse of that uh, definitely just have a different goal. If they seek purity, we can have that argument over for core Democratic issues. Are we better off having more heterodox candidates or not? Um, we feel pretty, pretty, uh, we have strong conviction that for both you know, the goal of moderation and even for the goal of, of you know, core democratic policy, um, this is a better path. For the democracy reform question, um, we have, you know, again, this shared DNA where we're like, yeah, this is really screwed up, this whole system. Like, this is pretty messed up and uh, there's got to be better paths. And we subscribe to this kind of, you know, the Steve Tellis future is faction um, of the need for partisan factions and this belief in partisan centrism um, and that there's a real and a realized lack of follow through often when a democracy reform does pass. Um, when you do change the, you get on the whiteboard and you figure out this is the exact perfect way to design an election, you have to actually follow up and, you know, read your book and go do the work. And we don't really see the connective tissue oftentimes between people who want to change the rules because they have a goal in mind, particularly a moderate goal, and places where the rules are already changed, uh, the rules are already the way that uh, they want them to be, um, or there's just opportunity to have that same goal of more competitive elections, more representative democracy, and either those groups or the adjacent groups aren't actually going and doing it with the rules we have right now. Um, so for people who want to change the rules, yeah, we say, that's great. We got to actually win under the rules and have democracy under, uh, you know, enlivened under the rules we have. And then we're going to have to do it even if these reforms do pass. Got it. So some of it is like some of the reforms uh, are either not likely to pass or w where they do pass, it doesn't necessarily have a strong connection to the depolarization goals and the um, uh, and the democracy protection goals that you're articulating. And then to the to the alternative strategies, it's interesting to think about some people who are supporting what you're doing might truly believe then they're they're kind of ideological moderates so they're just trying to get kind of the politics to be what they want it to be and other people are not necessarily committed to to moderation in and of itself they just think that that's the the path to having a, a stable a stable future so let me shift gears to strategies a bit because there's um a lot of ways i guess you could think about having a moderate faction in the Democratic Party, you could go to, uh, I don't know, Democratic Party conventions and talk about moderation. Uh, you could um, try to educate the public, but you have a, a fairly specific strategy 
And so maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what that is. Yeah. Um, so for moderates in particular, we see underinvestment at the intersection of this explicitly partisan Democrat, explicitly centrist, big tent, moderate, um, and also energetic electoral action um, on the extremes of both parties, um, naturally for ideological reasons, you know, correlating with, you know, energy and emotion and whatnot, um, but also due to, you know, special interest groups, long, you know, long time groups that are able to get boots on the ground and build networks and elevate superstars on the fringes. Um, that doesn't, the you know, moderates just, we have, we do have a lot of um, structural deficits um, for movement building um, or faction building. Um, so our specific tactic to contribute to this at this intersection of moderate Democrat and um, you know, energetic on the ground is to follow again, you know, this, this Steve Tellis um, future is faction recommendation, whereas you have to go to where your party is weak. Steve Tellis, by the way, for those who don't know, professor at Johns Hopkins, um, big thinker here on topic related to how to build a moderate faction uh, and, and how politics can work in a, in a sort of like a, a real, a realist kind of way. I'm not articulating it very well, but uh, for those who want to learn more, go check out Steve Tellis's work at Johns Hopkins. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, and I think from your left, from the from the the kickoff, uh, Agora. Um, so the concept would be like, if you wanted to be a moderate Republican um, and build a moderate Republican faction, you would try to elect like a city councilor in San Francisco or a governor of Massachusetts. Um, for us. We think that we have to not just say Democrats need to be more moderate. Um, we can't just say, hey, we should hold a conference and have people come together. We actually have to go do things. We have to show people what to do. And we have to do it together with people in an action that brings people closer together and builds community. So we have identified places where Democrats are weak, but not so weak that they can't win. And where there's underinvestment, but where the, if there was investment, the races could be competitive and where a leader would have to demonstrate significantly differentiated moderate credentials in order to win over those swing voters. And so we've chosen to focus on U.S. House districts in the R plus four to R plus eight. So places where Donald Trump got, you know, four or five, six, seven, eight points above his national average of 47 percent. Um, so last cycle, we built a cross-partisan due diligence team, kind of run like you know a venture or other investment firm would. Um, we did secondary analysis, identifying the about four dozen districts that fall into a range where they are safe, but potentially could be winnable. We did a second screen for incumbent Republicans who had undermined democracy, but also had other baggage. So we wanted to basically take a page out of the Justice Democrats AOC far left playbook where they, if you go, we always kind of say, like, if you look at who Justice Democrats beat, the Democratic incumbents who lost in 2018 and 2020, none of them could run a 10 minute mile, right? They were not going after like young, energetic, dynamic incumbents, right? They were going after people who hadn't run a competitive race in a long, long time. And so we wanted to find people who had incumbent Republicans who had undermined democracy, but also had other baggage. Um, so the two that this cross partisan team um, came out with, um, after going, you know, putting people on the ground, interviewing candidates, looking at data in different ways, and really trying to think about a venture style bet where the marketplace, as evidenced by like a Nate Silver forecast, thought Democrats had a 3% chance to win. We believe, back to the depolarizing and overhyping a polarization point, that with the right candidate, these places could be more like 10% or 15%. And that if we invested a million dollars, say, you would have a far greater return on that million dollars on flipping a seat than if you went to a seat that already had $30 million spent and was a toss up. Um, so we identified two districts. We took different approaches and different levels of investment in each. Um, one was Lauren Boebert as the incumbent. Um, she, you know, undermining democracy, also other baggage and more and more baggage as we see. And the second was Ken Calvert, uh, who was a California Republican who had not been challenged in uh, a couple decades. Uh, or at least one decade in any meaningful way. He had a prostitution charge investigated by the FBI, et cetera. And then we set out to find candidates who could be strongly differentiated from that. But I can get into kind of any, any more detail than that. But um, the goal is basically you go find these places that you can actually go do things and do things with people. 
And, you know, after our electoral activity, we reconvene with people. We go in a basement in D.C. every six months off the record, no lanyards. And it's just community building and learning and shared um, sense of a place that we're going. Um, and the hope is that this just builds and builds and builds on itself. We're, we're going from two congressional districts last cycle to six this cycle. Got it. So these are districts that are kind of not invested in by the Democrats because they're just a, they're perceived as a little out of reach. But because of a combination of the the fact that like maybe the candidate is weaker than it appears and um, no one's paying attention as an investment from some donors or people supporting this this pack um, or even volunteers, maybe there's a there's a there's a chance to flip a race that from Republicans to Democrats. Um, but it requires this special combination of essentially a, a moderate candidate who's uh you maybe not aligned with everything on the left of the Democratic Party um, and and uh, potentially a weak incumbent. Interesting. So I want to um, try to continue this conversation as we are racing Super Tux Cart, uh, just because, uh, uh, you know, it's been 15 minutes and I can't go farther than that without um, trying to play Super Tux Cart currently. So um, can you rejoin my server? Let me see. I'm going to now put the um, the screen onto you and your game. Let's see here. Yes. Okay. We are, see your game. Uh-oh. Um, okay. We are in. Okay. We're starting the race. Let's see if this works. I go back. Uh-oh. Back. No. no. The, go back to the server. Yeah. Go back to the server. Okay. Let's see if this works. You were there for a second. I screwed up. I thought I had to go back to start the game. Okay, we, we are now watching you choose your character. Uh, I'm going to choose Hexley. Who, who did you choose? I cho chose the Blowfish. Okay, and um, okay, Blowfish. Okay, great. Let's do let's do a three lap race. Do you have a preference for which uh, which one we do here? Uh, let's go Winter. Winter. Which one's Winter? Oh, right. Northern Resort. Hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, let's do it. Yep. Okay, great. Oh, there's math class. Okay. Oh, I'm in a different. Are we in the right one? Let's see. Oh, we're in. I don't know. We're not. We're in this one. Okay, two games. Okay. So now we can see uh, your game and my game. Wait, we're in different games? Oh, no. We're in the same game. Hold on. There we go. I, I gave you a bit of a head start accidentally. I'll have there to catch go. up. But we are there. We're going. Um. Oh, did I make you do something successfully? Yes. Whoa. Okay, so it's a three. It's a three lap game. I wish you the best of luck. And Thank did you. you say you said your uh, kids? Um, did you practice this game? I I did one one practice. This is not my. I really just played like Madden '97 and Game Day. Oh, I wasn't yeah, doing a lot of my card as kid. Ski free. Oh, it's kind of like that's interesting. Free. Sports, not you. You also didn't do like the shooting games. Um, no, I did a little. My nana, my uncle got a duck hunt or Nintendo at my. Uh, oh, the bananas are bad. Um, yeah, bananas are bad. I just, pa I think I just passed you. The bananas be bad. Potassium. What? You slip on bananas. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is getting competitive. Oh no. Okay, we're good. Um, yes, I'm right behind you. Uh, okay, can you tell us a story maybe from one of these races about like what moderation looks like? Because I can mean different things. Like, what what do you think speaks to people in the districts that you operated in so far? Um, well, one context thing on that. So when we started coming up with this idea, we reached out to the people who had like the most. Um, why are you faster than I? Because I got a special thing. I got a special, oh. you know. Thing. You, you got to get the presents, you know? That's it, the bowling balls, right? Okay, so we, we we literally called, like, Joe Manchin's, you know, team and Charlie Baker's team and other other people who had demonstrated an ability to win what we call win the middle, like win tons of split ticket voters. And so we talked yeah. to a bunch of people who worked on campaigns like that. And the thing that jumped out is we'd be like, well, how do you, you know, where are like the conferences about winning swing voters and like really differentiating from the party brand? And this, the first two conversations we had were both with very mild mild mannered people. 
And they both basically got really upset. And they were like, no one ever asks. No one asks us how we do. And you know, these are people who are winning like, you know, 40% of the other party's voters. Um, and it wasn't just those kids, it was a bunch of different kind of the campaigns all around the country that had done it the most. And they're like, there's nowhere to go learn. There's no like association of like split ticket candidates who get split tickets. And yeah. so um, we started collecting uh, started collecting stories. I'd say, I mean, the, 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 oh, come on. The, the, <laughs> the main, um, the main theme is to your question about like, where do they differentiate from the party orthodoxy? Yeah. Is, you know, you find issues where you like personally, credibly, authentically are different from your party. And then you kind of connect that to your story and it shows people you know charlie baker's advisor said like you you know it's kind of like the whole like henry ford if you ask people what they want they would say uh you know they would have said a faster horse not a car it's like you gotta show people that you are differentiated from the party you gotta show people and they may not you know that you're relentlessly pragmatic and they may not you know answer in a poll question on an issue you kind of just gotta identify something that you know, a lot of it's heartbeat. It's not just the math of it. Um, and do you think voters actually, like, do you feel, do you think voters really can perceive that? Yeah. Okay. So, like, you know the study where, like, they show, I won. Oh, damn it. Oh, I lost by so little. Ah, three seconds. Damn it. Can we do again? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Okay. Continue. <laughs> Wait, how do I? Oh, waiting for others. I think I'm in charge. I think I'm in charge of this. Maybe that's why. Wait. Really? No. Okay. Maybe I had the wrong guy. I'm gonna change my. I, I can't believe. I, well, I beat Hari, which I feel good about, but I'm mad that I lost my first race here. Okay, three laps again. All right, you can choose it. I think you can choose it. Oh, I'll do the mini golf. Well, golf. Uh, yeah, I guess golf. We'll we'll go. Wait, standard. Oh shoot, wait, mini golf. Yeah, oh, we'll do we'll do a question mark. I kind of like the idea of golf because it's like Democrats are winning over all these, you know, former country club Republicans. But um, so, uh, I mean, I'd say one of the one of the cool like if if well, one thing is like if you're gonna win, like really win a seat that's hard to win, you need to do it fundamentally differently than the way that swing races or yeah. Democratic primaries are run. But the entire industry is like built for different races. So like the industry is, there's not like a sub, we need like, we need a cottage industry of people who are like, I can win like 10% of Trump voters. You know? Oh no. We don't really have that. Yeah, it's sorry, I just, I just fell off into the, into the ocean. So, so because why, why is that? Like why? Because it's not as lucrative. I mean, the industry is built on people who make 12 and a half percent of a TV ad buy in the millions, right? Um, or people who are like, I'm 24 and I want to be like the campaign, whatever, field director or campaign manager of someone who has like a 50, 60, 70, 80 percent chance of being in Congress. And so then I can go be like the chief staff being like, hey, you have a like for the races that we want to pick, like you have a 15 percent chance of doing something really hard in an industry where like everything's like an anecdote and you don't actually get the credibility. It's not like act- it's not like be- it's like being at a VC firm or being at a startup where it's like. No, you're actually going to reap like the twenty x rewards if you you are totally beating the market. Um, but the, the, so like Adam Frisch, who challenged Lauren Boebert, has this great my co-founder of Lauren Harper uh, yeah. has a video I'm on our website. We have this little like sub thing called Win the Middle, Win the Middle.org, where you can go find the case studies on on this. Because part of it's like if there's no conferences or learning, we want to be like writing down what we're learning, capturing it, sharing it, getting feedback, etc. So Adam Frisch. You know, he lives in Lauren Bober's district. He's like a normal guy. He's a registered independent, you know, impressive person, business leader, had served in local office, but was a registered independent. And is like a deeply, you know, he's a pretty, he's a, he's a good, you know, he's a father and a son and husband and, you know, like, but in a truly normal sense, he wasn't like crisscrossing the country getting ready to run a presidential campaign, you know, or political yeah. campaign. So he's just like, man, you know, things are getting really crazy. And like, I can't believe after redistricting, like Lauren Boebert is my state rep. I mean, my member of Congress. So right. he looks at the numbers and it's like, okay, Trump got 53% in this district. 
He's like, so I only need to get 3% of people? And you see like tens of millions of dollars going to Marjorie Taylor Greene's district where Trump got like 65% of it. But you just had this irrational marketplace. Like there was no investment in this. And so he yeah. runs it, he's a currency trader. He's just like, I'm an investor. Like I, he's like, this is a good bet. Um, I'm just gonna go be normal and appeal to people in a you know normal way. He's, the, the unknown thing about uh, Frisch, which is really cool is he actually, it's like, oh, he lost a voter by 500 votes. He got no zero dollars from the National Democratic Party committees. Um, but the bigger thing is he only won the primary by 200 votes. And so you get normal like political people and they're like, we need to win the primary first and then we'll win the general. It's like when you're right. in one of these races, like if you're just talking to Democratic primary voters and interest groups all day, for so like the entire primary, yeah, we're not really going to be ready for the general. You actually want a tough primary against a super lefty, out of touch primary challenger, because then you get all this free media and brand, and everyone's like, "Oh, surprisingly, the independent turn, you know, who barely registered late as a Democrat, like barely beat this leftist in the primary." Like people are then you're just branded as the moderate, and people uh, and you've been authentically telling people, "Damn it, damn it." Saw, uh, I just can't believe it. How bad I I'm listening to the story, but I just uh, it's unbelievable. This is like a rope a dope thing. Oh God! All right, you know what? We're just gonna go back to chatting because I I you yeah. just embarrassed me and you've embarrassed me again. <laughs> Are you still there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, but I, you're frozen, or really? I can't see you. That's one uh, thing. Could you see me before? Oh. No. I just want you to know I can't see it. Okay, leave. Oh, stop sharing. I'll stop sharing. Okay, we're good. We're good. Okay. Yeah, so, wait, can I ask you a question about this guy, though? I, I know we only have a couple minutes, but, like, did they, yeah. do, do you feel like it's, is it, is it just, does moderate to you, if you were to say, like, what, what is, what makes the moderate candidate succeed? Is it social moderation? Is it economic moderation? Just style? Is it background? Uh, you know, like a traditional background? Is it that they don't talk about, uh, hot button issues. Is there like a path? I, there, there's no one. There's no one set formula. I mean, I think authenticity is more important than all those things. And I think oddly, like it actually takes more like liberal ish qualities to be a moderate because you're you need a lot of empathy. It's funny on one of our first kind of retreats with candidates and people working in these places. A lot of people talked about meditation as moderates. And like, you actually have to be like pretty firmly in touch with yourself and project that authenticity. And yeah, it could be any of those issues and it can be personal style that's different, but it's more about, you know, I think projecting authenticity and that authenticity often has to be different from the voters in that district's perception of your party and the things they don't like about your party. Got it. Okay. Well, we're basically out of time. Um, but, uh, this was very useful for us to learn about this. So what we have here is a goal of trying to have a, a continuing uh, a strong democracy with moderation. In this case, we're talking about moderation within the Democratic Party, uh, but in part by recruiting candidates who can win Republican seats if it has the right recipe. And Liam and the Welcome Pack are um, are trying to do that by being very strategic and uh, in in the, the races they're supporting. Um, any any last words of insight to our students or to our to anyone looking at this about what lessons you've learned in politics more broadly about how to make a difference? I would say if you're one of those students or budding particularly democratic uh, activists who feels like there's a little voice that's like, you know, my uncles or my cousins or the people I grew up with or whatnot, like, they don't vibe with all this stuff. And also, like, I don't know if I'm deeply, you know, hold convictions across the whole litany of leftist issues. Um, we need people to follow that voice and follow that sense that things are wrong. And actually, to protect democracy, we just got to go practice it. And that's going to mean, like, reaching out to people and bringing them in. And so we don't have a lot of people running organizations like this, starting organizations like this, focused on like this. And we need all the help we can get. Um, and it's a lot of fun, a lot of good people. And once you're in, you don't get out because it's the way. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this and for spending a half hour together. And congratulations for, I I, I don't know how, but I imagine myself winning every one of these uh, 
of races. And I just feel like a failure, but I feel also like I've been a successful host in making you hopefully feel great about your victories here. Um, and, and now we'll see whether you, uh, whether you start a streak. <laughs> there we go. I'll be watching. Okay, thanks a lot, Liam. All right.